and thank you for joining us in the Fort Worth Public Library's Zoom room here. My name is Linda Barrett, and I'm the manager of genealogy, local history, and archives. And um, I'm going to go through a few announcements about some upcoming programs that we're offering here at the library. Um, I've got so I went ahead and posted those in the chat too, so you can scroll through those and um, the ones that require registration have links for that. On Tuesday evening, June the 8th, from 7 to 8, we have the Tuesday night trivia. The topic will be alternate and punk rock. Um, on June the 9th, which is Wednesday, there will be a session on real world retirement planning. And there's a link in the chat for uh, registering for that. On June 10th, we will have an outdoor in-person program at the Golden Triangle Branch. Um, it will be Clyburn in the community with Clyburn pianist Evan Mitchell and soprano Corey Donovan. On Saturday, June the 12th, there will be a, another outdoor program, Paper Making with Invasive Plants. And that's going to be from 1030 to 1230 in the morning. And there's also a link for that. I've also put in a link to the library's website, as well as our YouTube channel with, uh, it's the playlist for the TCU Center for Texas Studies Community History Workshops, Preserving Our Past videos. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Leanna Schooley, the Executive Director of the Center for Texas Studies. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Linda. Uh, I'm Linda. Before I get started with the introduction, I just wanted to check and see if we have Dr. G on the line. I'm not seeing. We do. Okay, very good. Just wanted to to make sure we didn't have a technical difficulty there. <laughs> so I want to welcome you all to TCU explores its past and expands its future with Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., um, where we're going to be discussing about the the uh, history and other interesting information that his Race and Reconciliation Initiative has discovered over the last year. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Gooding in a minute, but I want to uh, thank you all for joining us for the Preserving Our Past series. Uh, this is a bonus episode. We don't usually meet in June. Often it is September through May, the first Saturday of the month. And we're able to do this through the generous support of the Summerlee Foundation and the Summerfield G. Roberts Foundation. Um, our purpose is to offer ways um, for you to learn how to research, preserve, um, and learn about your own hometown and your own history. And I think you'll find that today's program is another of those really good examples of that, of, of, of folks at TCU um, uncovering part of their own past. Uh, now, the center celebrates all that makes Texas distinctive, and you can learn more about our programs and projects at our Facebook page, Center for Texas Studies at TCU, or uh, you can follow us on Instagram. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, if you would um, ask your questions on the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We would really appreciate that. You can ask, ask your question at any time through the program, but um, we will answer them all at the end. Um, also, if you have to uh, scoot out of the program a little early today, um, that's okay because this program is being recorded and will be available on the TCU Libraries uh, web page, uh, channel, YouTube channel, um, in maybe seven to 10 days. It depends on the processing time. Um, but all of our videos show up there and Linda has put that link in the chat for you. Now, uh, one last bit of housekeeping, and that is that this is our last program until September, but we hope to truly see you in September. It is our plan to be able to meet in person. So please stay tuned for further information about that. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., otherwise known as Dr. G around campus, uh, is an associate professor within the Honors College at TCU. Um, he uh, critically analyzes race within mainstream media, uh, effectively contextualizing problematic patterns based on their historical roots. As such, his best-known work 
um, is, you mean there's race in my movie? The Complete Guide to Understanding Race in Mainstream Hollywood. And, and that work has been used in high schools and universities nationwide. He is also the co-editor of Stories from the Front Room, How Higher Education Faculty Overcome Challenges and Thrive in the Academy. And uh, he has stayed focused on the practical applications of equity with his 2018 book, American Dream Deferred, which carefully details the growth and struggles of Black federal workers in the post-war era. Now his latest work, Black Oscar, which was released in May of 2020, expands the reach, his reach, his research reach uh, into cultural studies by analyzing African-American Academy Award winners and how their, their narratives reflect and reinforce larger American history. So you can see that he is gonna be using some of the, uh, the theories and methods that he has used in his other research uh, to be able to help build and expand on TCU's story. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gooding to reveal uh, what he has learned in his first year of research. Dr. Gooding. Well, thank you, Anna. And thank you also, Linda, the Fort Worth Public Library for opening up the space as it is indeed important for us to continue to make these connections. After all, um, a wise person once told me many, many moons ago that that which is not shared is lost. So as has been indicated by the introduction, we over at Texas Christian University have been hard at work trying to cover and discover uh, aspects of our past so that we could tell the full story of our history. And how do we reconcile our present status as we look forward to moving forward based on what we now know about the past, right? So this idea of reconciliation is uh, not new, but it is new for us in terms of us practicing it. And I would like to share what we have learned as a result of our journey up to this point with us formally taking on this challenge last year. But before I begin and go into the, the nitty gritty and the details about what we discovered and what we uncovered this past year, let me just start off with a simple exercise. So for those of you who are tuned in, I would like for you to get prepared to type a simple response. Watch me carefully. Now, if I have at least three volunteers who could type into Q&A or chat function, or either, um, what just happened? Again, just take a few seconds. I'll wait. Um, you know, again, you might be able to use the uh, Q&A function if you can't see the chat function. Um, but if you just, a couple of moments, just, say what, what you think just happened, okay? Um, while I'm waiting for that, um, I also would like to make a small plug um, of other events that are happening in the city of Fort Worth, and that would be uh, next Thursday, there is a series kicking off entitled Movies That Matter at the Modern Museum. And if you haven't been to them lately, the news is doors open, and this would be an excellent opportunity for you all to um, jump in and join some of these conversations. All righty. Well, um, let me see, I have Cindy with a, a contribution, uh, Kathleen with a contribution. Uh, let me see here. Um, Carolyn, very good. So here's the deal. Notice, and again, mind you, I mean, this is just, you know, we're, we're limited by the, the small amount of space and people are probably typing quickly. But notice how I don't see any two, I mean, one says pin drop and pin dropped, right? But I don't see any two descriptions that are identical. I don't see any descriptions that are identical. So Carolyn, for example, starts off saying that, you know, she names me as an 
I held a green pin and I dropped it. Let's not overlook the significance of how she used an adjective green to describe the pin, whereas Kathy just said pin drop, right? Kathleen also described that I dropped the pin, but she didn't describe the color, although she threw in a little bit more detail about how I lifted my finger, right? And then Arturo also added in this context about how it made a sound. Fascinating. So, if I'm correct, I believe all of us were fully present in that moment, right? Um, we all were fully present. We all shared a moment. But when I asked for accounts or recounts of what happened in the past. I mean, technically it is something that happened, right? I mean, you know, you all talked about dropped, past tense, right? Something that happened in the past. What's fascinating is how we all saw the same thing, but it's possible that we all may not see the same thing or see it the same. How fascinating. We cannot take this. So you can imagine if all of us are awake and alert. I mean, God bless you. You got up to log into a, a library academic on a Saturday morning. <laughs> God bless you, right? For those of you who did this. So you're alert, you're aware, you're, you're full of life and energy. But yet there appears to be some calibration that needs to take place, not necessarily disagreement, but calibration in terms of how do we tell the story of the past? What's the most, what's the most descriptive way? What is the most possible to tell what happened? So if we have variants just for what happened with a simple pin drop. Yes, it is green. Even though I, I rock the purple palace, I'm just North Texas, you know, just general, right? You know, I'm just to North Texas in general. Um, you can only have a question like this of how do we tell the story of the past increase in this difficulty when you're talking a larger period of time, right? And not just a larger period of time, but you're talking about a period of time that, I mean, for many of us who logged in this morning, uh, very, some of us are maybe interested in just Texas history. Some of us are perhaps in interested in what TCU is doing. Some of us are just faithful patrons of the library system, or some of us just love handsome black men with curly hair whatever your reasons, you can only imagine that telling the history of an educational institution that's been around for a century and a half, there are so many different perspectives. You see, if anything, where, where we can start is that, I'm not right as a historian, but what really came to bear was just how powerful history can be, how personal it can be, and also how political history can be. Before I get into the details about TCU, I, I would be remiss if I didn't make mention of what's happening nationally and that for those of you who are watching the news, you're aware of going debates from California to even our state over whether teaching critical race theory is appropriate or not? Is it anti-American or not, right? And there's this ongoing tension over what parts of the story to tell. And how do we tell that story? You know, is it part of a left-wing agenda or is it, is it, is it anti-American? I mean, there's still an ongoing tension. 
So I'm not going to touch that political football right now, although I'm not afraid to. I want to stay focused and talk about what happens as here with TCU and the Race and Reconciliation Initiative, or RRI. But imagine how the question has been around for nearly 150 years. Our sesquicentennial is coming in 2023. The nation was founded in 1873. With so many people who have been a part of TCU, whether they were students, whether they were faculty, whether they were staff, or whether they're still connected as alumni, or just as community members who have observed TCU from afar, or from up, right? You know, baseball come back last night, go frogs. You can imagine how it can be complicated. It can be a difficult proposition as to how to tell the story. So that was the on our plate. I just wanted to set the tone, right? Because uh, while well, again, um, you know, we uh, do our best to uh, essentialize and, and distill, by no means, ladies and gentlemen, was this easy. So I just want to put that out from the forefront. And by no means is this a finished product. So if you have a criticism or critique, it might be. Uh, all accounts were still just beginning. We're on the path to telling our story and still working through the best way to do that. And so to the extent that you um, are interested in joining the conversation, feel free to add on. Um, you know, we do believe in the value of constructive criticism, but um, you know, the other type, maybe not as helpful. So how about this? In order to uh, why don't I backtrack? How do we get to this point? Well, May 25th, 20, there was a human being by the name of George Floyd who, despite making desperate pleas, his mother had his very essence in life squeezed out of him as former officer Derek Chauvin refused to lift his knee from his neck. If this is news, I don't know, maybe perhaps part of a new mission to Mars, but this is news to you. Um, so that part may not be news to you. Um, it was absolutely horrifying. I don't recall seeing anything quite so dastardly in all my life, quite frankly. And I've seen a lot. I'm from Philadelphia. It was absolutely bone chilling. And so I think that was an inflection point for many institutions and individuals to take stock of that which is hidden in plain sight. And ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about institutional systemic racism. So George was an unassailable case. Remember, we had similar debates with Michael Brown, similar debates with Trayvon Martin, but there were no cameras. I wasn't there, you weren't there, but we saw with our own eyes. I mean, after, Three minutes and 46 seconds. If Derek Chauvin had gotten up off his knee, I still believe that George Floyd would have been handcuffed. After four minutes and 46 seconds, if Derek Chauvin had gotten up off his knee, I still believe George Floyd still would have been unarmed. After five minutes and 46 seconds, had Derek gotten off his knee, I still believe that he would have had the badge. After six minutes and 46 seconds, had Derek Chauvin got up off his knee, I still believe he would have had the gun. The point is that there was ample time. And so as we calibrate what happened in that moment, many institutions, many individuals decided to take stock. 
I do not wish to represent that that is the sole reason why TCU began its journey with respect to race and reconciliation. But I, I'd be fooling everybody if I said it wasn't a factor, okay? Um, many good people have been, getting, have been doing a lot of good work before I even stepped foot on campus. And so the idea of pushing TCU to improve is not new. But in terms of TCU formalizing and being very and explicit about its attempt to reconcile with the past, this is new in that regard. And so by unanimous vote of the Board of Ch Trustees and by support of the Office of the Chancellor, the RRI office, and RRI again stands for Race and Reconciliation Initiative. Um, what I'll do is I'll drop in the chat uh, while, while I'm talking uh, for your edification, our general website, okay? Uh, by the way, a little backstory is that when we first started back in, because the call came down in July of last year, and then August is when we really started in earnest. And when we started, we started with nothing. We literally had to build our staircase as we climbed, okay? And we initially started with literally one web page, just one, one page. And now, as you see, if you're clicking through, um, it's quite developed, okay? And this all happened over the year. And let me um, use a general overview of what our plan was with respect to um, creating a system for success, telling our story, okay? Um, and essentially, I can uh, distill it down to, oh, no, 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 why don't we do this first? At a glance. So going back to our pen exercise, you see how a number of questions are raised as to how do you uh, tell a story, okay? Um, one of the first things that we did that we found to be very instructive and useful was that we uh, affiliated ourselves early on with an international consortium of other universities uh, who were studying themselves. And that is entitled Universities Studying Slavery. It is an international consortium of roughly um, some 60 plus universities. And we credit the University of Virginia for really um, helping to get this initiative started. And in case you're interested in more information, there that is. And what was key is that, um, well, the backstory to that is in, in 2003, actually, Brown University uh, first did an inventory. Um, and again, magically, uh, when the president of Brown happened to be a black female, uh, you know, you have a new voice who actually says, maybe we should check into our relationship with the past. And they found some, uh, you know, uncomfortable facts, right? This idea that there was indeed uh, express connection to enslavement, right? You know, that they benefited, versus I believe they absolutely benefited. And so they started that process in 2003. They didn't come go public really with their findings until 2006. And then in the aftermath of that, uh, University of Virginia was inspired and decided to also look at their history because if, if you haven't been to the East Coast or don't know, um, from roughly, I wanna say 1819, um, 1865, uh, they absolutely, absolutely employed labor in the construction of the university, okay? And in fact, our founding father, Thomas Jefferson, um, was clever enough to de devise these serpentine walls that would actually hide the enslaved labor. So that way, uh, it's almost as if you know, you should showed up to a movie set. You know, you didn't see how it's really two dimensional, but if you were a white student, particularly a white male, you were able to enjoy this academical commons and this, 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 this place of higher learning and, you know, an education and whatnot. Meanwhile, the, the enslaved labor was hidden, right? You know, so the people who chopped the wood and, you know, made your food, you know, they were hidden by these serpentine walls. So um, there's no secret about this. And University of Virginia, started to document and acknowledge. And in case you haven't uh, read about it or heard about it, they 
uh, just recently actually created a, uh, a monument to the enslaved labor, um, you know, and uh, I think that, um, you know, what I can do is put that also uh, now, uh, in, in the chat in just a second, you know, the memorial to enslaved labor um, that you all should um, definitely be apprised of. And so the idea is that by them going through the process of uh, investigating their history and, you know, dealing with the tough questions, uh, no matter how dark or embarrassing, that also other universities to join in, right? Mostly on the, the East board and in the South, I imagine. But um, we, even though we don't have that same type of history, remember we were founded in 1873. So the quick answer is no. Um, we do not have any um, uh, explicit or overt expressed ties to enslavement. What I can tell you is that the father, the founders of TCA, Addison Randolph Clark, did indeed own enslaved labor at some point in his life. The conspiracy is real, and you see the dangers of telling the truth. Right? Your mic gets cut off, right? Okay, I'm just, just kidding there. Um, so the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, just to continue what I was saying, um, this consortium was very helpful and us being able to compare notes to figure out, well, how do you go about this enterprise? And so with respect to us, I, I wanna just paint a glance and then talk a little bit more about you know, what it is that we found and, and how we went about finding it. Um, so we essentially decided we had to organize ourselves, okay? Um, and so the first thing I had to do was, uh, you know, I don't know if you all have seen any of these uh, movies where you know the meteor is crashing the earth and you know send you know a motley crew up to the to the moon and you know blow up some asteroid or something like that nature well that, that's exactly who i was and how i felt right in terms of um you know the school year was starting and i had to scramble very quickly to find um the right people to help right with this enterprise and so um i settled upon a committee of 15 people with eight ex officio members, uh, you know, who had key positions throughout a year, right? You know, whether it be marketing or the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, or, you know, within the library, uh, you know, we can't forget our librarians, right, Linda? And so, um, you know, so those ex officio members were very, very helpful in terms of continued counsel and guidance. But with respect to the, uh, the 15 members, I'm the 15th, so there are these 14 other members, they were divided uh, in pairs to co chair these seven task forces, okay? Because these were the aspects that we wanted to, um, to, to look at. Because um, let me skip over, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take a pause from this to, to this, to say that when, when looking at the idea that the Board of Trustees and the Chancellor gave us at least one year to work with, we had a unique challenge. Unlike the University of Virginia that I mentioned earlier, they actually took, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, seven years before they produced their first, shall we write or report about what they discovered and how they discovered it in names and in future. They're just a different case. I mean, descendants of enslaved labor actually live in Charlottesville, Virginia still. And so they have to uh, reconcile the relationship, uh, you know, um, you know, with uh, those who have been exploited, right? And have not, you know, from the largest the University of Virginia, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a whole different, but um, with respect to us, we only had fear for sure. So we wanted to produce something that was tangible as a good faith deposit, if you would, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the public trust of goodwill, right? If a year just went by and happened, you can imagine the uh, critiques. Oh, TCU is being performative. You know, they they rushed to put together this this initiative and in aftermath of George Floyd. They're not really uh, you know sincere. Uh, you know, so um, had that challenge of producing something tangible, but at the same time, we don't want to rush right and, and produce something that's of low quality and, and of no use to anybody. So. I came up with this idea of Operation Triangulation, meaning that we would produce 
a first year survey report, right? So we took the pressure off ourselves by saying that we were not, we simply were not going to within the span of nine months with mostly volunteer labor, um, um, I did receive a modest, um, but other than that, we're talking about mostly volunteer labor, right? Um, you know, you're talking about people who are, you know, doing their day jobs, you know, whether it be staff or faculty or students. So, and you have this winter break and, oh, don't forget this COVID thing, right? And how are we going to, you know, produce an exhaustive, uh, you know, report, you know, that's covering and spanning nearly 150 years? So, the idea was when you go out in the road and see construction uh, workers with those um, those yellow tripods, right? Y'all have seen those yellow tripods. Um, what are they doing with these yellow tripods? Does, does anyone know when, when they're like looking through those yellow tripods? I'm, I'm just making sure everybody's awake here. Can, can someone drop me a, a message in the chat? Or what, what, what do you think they're doing with, with those tripods? Let me know. You know, looking through those mirrors. Does anybody know? Survey, Linda. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. So that's the idea. The idea is that it's inefficient to when you're to um, you know you know ascertain how large a tract of land is. It's inefficient to have to walk the you know the whole expanse of the land yourself physically, right? And so what they do is they set up these mirrors essentially at, at you know certain distance the mirrors reflect and you know survey and, and make an approximation as to um you know and a calculation as to the, the larger area that they're working with ergo our operation triangulation what we wanted to do was uh pick three key windows in time as i call them so that we figure out at a glance what we're working with and then based upon what we find, use that as a basis for deeper dives, okay? And so um, this three-dimensional approach is what we affectionately call operational triangulation. And just by way of a quick review, the three windows in time were uh, number one, the founding years, um, the 30-year window from 1861 to 1891, because this uh, helped us fulfill the charge that delivered for us to study TC's relationship with slavery, racism, and the Confederacy. So, as you know, during 1861, enslavement was still legal and alive, right? And um, also during 1861 to 1865, there's this skirmish called the Civil War. So that covers that piece of the Confederacy. Well, arguably it started ever since 1619, um, you know, and, and it's still something that we're wrestling with today. So 1861, you see the key question is, how did the institution of enslavement affect TCU's uh, formation? Um, and so the quick answer to that question is not so much, right? Like we told you that the other founders, Joseph Addison Park, uh, did indeed own um, a couple of enslaved individuals um, you know, um, in his career early in his career. But we do not have any document, uh, you know, documentation or proof that uh, that he used enslaved labor, you know, to 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 help his sons, you know, build their wealth. Um, Addison and Randolph Clark are the founders of TCU, and with respect to um, uh, answering questions about the Confederacy, that is a different question, right? That that we can speak to, um, and I'll circle back to that. Um, with respect to the second key window. That is the transition to integration into 1971. And um, we chose this window in time because um, not only did our country, as you all know, if I have any baby boomers in the house, not only did we know that, I mean, this is absolutely a game changer for the United States of America or two minutes as far as, um, you know, us truly being launched towards the forefront of, you know, global enterprise, right? Um, so covers that time period whereby TCU actually integrated. So it's old hat now, perhaps. We have to remember that some of us were alive during the time when TCU integrated. Isn't that fascinating? That for nearly a century, 
you know, TCU um, was an all white institution. Again, TCU is, uh, you know, not exceptional in this respect. I mean, Rice University, you know, it was all white for the longest time. And, you know, many other institutions were, were just segregated. Our society was segregated, right? And so um, we wanted to chronicle this period in terms of that transition. What were the argument dialogues, you know, who opposed it? And we cut it off at 1971, the 30-year period consistent with the first period. And also because that was considered at the time a high watermark. Uh, Jennifer Giddings Brooks uh, was the uh, first uh, Miss Black TCU. And, um, you know, so for many at that time, so TCU integrated, uh, you know, with full in the 60s, although earlier there were some students who took classes, although not full time for credit, um, as a typical undergrad, if you will. Um, the idea is that, you know, um, even though it wasn't until the 60s when this happened, um, the idea was that, okay, wow, look, look at Jennifer. She's Miss TCU. Uh, you know, uh, this actually may be a, 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 a mistake. I think she was the first Black homecoming queen. You get the idea. But the idea is that, um, oh man, you know, we're good to go. You know, clearly we're all equal, right? Because she was able to make it into this position. Just like many people believe that we a post-racial society once Barack Hussein Obama was elected president. I don't know if that quite worked out that way. That's another story for another time. The third, um, and so the, the, the key question here is how does systemic racism discrimination continue to manifest, right? Because now that, um, you know, the door is open, the question is, um, you know, is the playing field um, truly equal? You know, and TCU right now, still the demographic is mostly white, um, most, you know, um, absolutely. So um, that's no surprise. And the question is, you know, this raises other questions about opportunity and access, right? You know, in the larger dynamic. Um, the third window is recent but related histories. Uh, we started in 1998. We don't have a, a, a clean 30 year period uh, like with the other two. Oh, partly because in 1998 is when TCU had its first ever non-disciple of Christ chancellor, right? So the C in TCU, Christian, um, is related to disciples of Christ, um, you, know, um, you know, backing um, in, in its early years, okay? And so as a result of that relationship, every chancellor up until 1998 was somehow affiliated with disciples of Christ. And also uh, Chancellor Michael Ferrari was the first Texas history buffs, non-Texan, ah, right? First uh, to, to lead the helm. And so with that difference of background comes a difference of perspective. And, and many credit him as starting to push TCU towards the 21st century, that is with respect to starting to have these uh, key conversations surrounding race. And so the key question, and we ended it in January 2020 um, because you know it's hard to study the president. You have to have a cut point, cut off point. So that was our perspective and our approach, right? You know, I, which I think was a healthy one. This idea of whatever we find is what we find. I mean, we we really had no agenda in that respect except to tell the story of what it is that we found. And speaking of what we found, we went into the archives. Um, well, not we. I want to credit um, our, our TC students, right? We assembled a team of student archivists, um, you know, with, uh, you know, obviously direction and leadership from, um, you know, library staff, Mary Saffo and, and others, uh, and also a postdoctoral fellow, uh, Dr. Sylvia Greensward. And the idea is that um, we started to gather the information and, and gather the, the facts, um, you know, and collect them so that way the seven different task forces that you see up here were able to access the information um, and start piecing together, um, you know, their pieces of the puzzle, right? And as you see here, um, this is where piece, uh, things got a little more interesting. The, the idea is that um, what we did early on that I think also was effective was we created a target. So came up with the idea of reconciliation day, meaning that it would be a day late in the spring semester, because remember we started this in August of 2020. So reconciliation day, uh, which ended up being April 21st, 
2021, by the way. So 421-21, it was Wednesday. It was a beautiful day, by the way. Um, that became our target by which we said we were going to publicly share the results of our first year survey report. Again, it was a bit risky in that we didn't know what we were going to find and we didn't know um, exactly how we we're going to stitch everything together in terms of what we found. But that target date, I think really helped focus um, you know, the attention of you know, those on the sidelines and those you know, who are in the trenches in terms of, oh, okay, us being able to produce something tangible, okay? So in the meantime, I say that to say that for point number three here, what we wanted to do was not just, um, and because again, this goes back to what I uh, layered earlier with respect to our relationship with universities studying slavery. We saw effective models and shall we say not, you know, models that weren't quite so effective. Um, and one of the pieces that we thought was effective was when, um, these task forces were in content, constant contact and communication with the public. What was not quite as effective was when uh, there was a decree from on high, oh, we're going to study our history. And then, you know, months went by, no one heard anything. And then all of a sudden, there's a, a you know, a, a report that's released online and click on the link and check it out, right? And so we uh, did not want to do a disservice to all those who were laboring. Um, you know, to find this information and put it together, we wanted to make sure that we tilled the ground properly so that there was a ready audience uh, who was prepared for what it was that we, we found. So point number three, as you see, we decided to create numerous contact points um, for continued conversation. And one of the methods was through monthly virtual town halls. Um, we also uh, ended up creating, uh, uh, which I thought was quite clever, uh, and this was the brainchild of our, our uh, graduate research assistant, uh, Mr. Mr. Marcellus Perkins. And for anyone who's out there watching, you all know uh, about the amazing, mellifluous and marvelous uh, Mr. Marcellus Perkins. I, I would definitely want to give him a shout out as well. And um, one of the, the things that we did was, um, you know, through his uh, leadership, right? You didn't know the youth could lead? Yes, through his leadership, is we created a podcast, right? Um, and that was a very effective way for us to uh, not only highlight good people on our campus who are doing good work, right? You know, in the name of reconciliation. I mean, they didn't do it because they were a part of the initiative. They just did it because it was the right thing to do. It was just part of their job. So not only were we able to highlight these, these good people, but also we were able to uh, create an audience. And uh, I'm pleased to state that um, this podcast has, uh, without any benefit of advertising or anything of that nature, I mean, I, I, uh, Ms. Perkins would have to you know, correct me, but I believe it's had over a thousand listens. I mean, and um, it's, it's been um, you know, broadcast in, I think, six or seven countries, um, you know, internationally, right? Who knew? But um, the idea was that this was an effective way for us to uh, let people know what we were doing, right? You know, and again, this idea that, um, you know, well, some had the critique that TCU is performative. And again, I, I understand that TCU may have earned, you know, that reputation of being performative. I mean, you know, many institutions have, right? I mean, I remember last year, my bank was sending me emails about how they stand with me for Juneteenth. I mean, I'm not trying to be rude, but I, I just don't recall them celebrating Juneteenth any other years. But magically, you had the George Floyd murder, and then you know, all of a sudden my bank is celebrating Juneteenth. They're literally sending me emails, you know, in black and everything. And so, you know, my question is, okay, that's great you celebrate Juneteenth bank, but what about July 10th? What about August 10th? What about September 10th? You understand what I'm saying? And so the idea is how consistent are we, right? And so we'll see if they celebrate. Well, actually, I don't recall receiving an email from them this year. I mean, well, Juneteenth is still a couple weeks away, so there's still hope. We'll see. But the point is, um, these podcasts were a way to show the consistency, right? You know, that, you know, we were serious about, uh, you know, pushing this forward, you know, not just one time flash in the pan. Um, not to mention, we also, in, in those, uh, doc, uh, excuse me, in those podcasts, uh, if you listen to them, um, you'll hear most part two interviews of two different people within a half hour and what's sandwiched in between or what they sandwich is or whatever. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a grammarian, I'm a historian. What is sandwiched in between is 
uh, a doc talk, right? Thought it was a clever title. You know, this idea that um, you would have uh, individuals who are doing the research, in, you know, in the archives share what they actually found, right? Um, and the meaning of what they found, whether it be a document, whether it be a photograph. So in other words, there was this continual flow of information, right? It wasn't this uh, secret and it wasn't a mystery. Um, you know, we wanted to be as transparent as possible, right? Because again, the truth is the truth, <laughs> right? right? I mean, you, you don't, don't get mad at me. I mean, get, get mad at the truth. <laughs> but if it's the truth, there's nothing to get mad at, right? So that was the thinking in a way. So those um, sessions, um, you know, were, were important in order to build a community that was prepared. Because what's fascinating is, even though we're a relatively small campus compared to the UT Horns Down, sorry about that, um, you know, we're only roughly a little bit over 10,000 uh, students uh, undergrad. It's still difficult to spread the word, right? You know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, just think about your institution organization. I mean, email goes out, but is everybody on board? Did, did everybody get the memo, that sort of deal? So you're talking about thousands of people who are living their lives and different agendas, you know, it's difficult, right? So we, we constantly had to make continual effort to let people know, oh, did you hear about this? Oh, no, I, you know, it, 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 it answers a range from, oh, yes, I did, and I volunteered, because we also, on our website, if you look, you know, created a porthole whereby people were able to also become a part of the movement, right? I think that was also important to create that outlet um, as well. That was, that was an important feature. So, but responsibly range from, uh, I have no idea what you're talking about, to I think I heard something, you know, right? So it, 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 was, it was important, it was necessary for us to, um, keep our foot on the gas in that respect, right? Um, and so uh, another key step in number four was that while it made it more difficult for us was um, we actually had to finish our report way before April because we wanted to send it out for a light peer review, if you would. So we sent it out to um, numerous historians um, and also members of our local Fort Worth community. And I'm grateful, I don't know if I should mention their names, but. Um, I'm grateful to uh, you know, um, those members of the community who did take the time to uh, read our report and provide their feedback. Um, you know, and so we wanted to then incorporate that feedback um, you know, and, and, and make sure that we're you know, presenting the, the, the most accurate picture possible um, in the most concise manner. Um, and then not, not only just produce a report, but also recommendations, because the last thing we want to do is create a report that collects dust, oh, ho hum, and life moves on. No, I mean, the idea is that how do we change, right? I mean, isn't that the key question? How do we change, right? If there were some pieces that we could have done better in the past, the question is how do we change, right? And so what we did was we took our seven task forces and essentially distilled down much of what we learned to seven key recommendations that we provided to the Board of Trustees. The timing was uh, such whereby the Board of Trustees actually met on the 9th of April. Um, and so a couple of weeks before uh, uh, um, the uh, Reconciliation Day where we actually released the report to everybody. But um, we didn't know what the Board was going to do or how the Board was going to react. But uh, it just so happens, uh, and my colleague, Holly Elman, <laughs> uh, surprised me with this, um, that same day, because it was um, necessary for me and Ms. Perkins and also the SGA president, Paige Shuring, who was also quite supportive, to present to the Board of Trustees um, what we found. Um, you know, it was a more detailed version of what I And lo and behold, um, as a testament to all the labor and all the hard work and you know, the insightful, caring work that was done by um, members of our community, the board, I, I think was so persuaded or moved that they accepted unanimously all the recommendations the very same day, the very same day. So with that head of steam, we went into reconciliation day, um, you know, um, on the 21st of April and delivered the, the report to the public. And if you want a taste of what the public saw or, or experienced on Reconciliation Day, um, I'll be more than happy to oblige. 
Um, and so uh, if you all uh, want to see a taste of what actually happened, what transpired that day, um, why don't I go ahead and share my screen and show you um, a little snippet of, uh, I think gives you a glimpse of what occurred and transpired on that, on that beautiful day. So what does reconciliation mean to me? Quite simply, it's the opportunity to come together so that we can move forward together. Today we are here for our first ever Race and Reconciliation Day. And so this is a novel event whereby we're going to have various aspects of our campus community come together. We're going to have spoken word, musical performances, we're going to have song, and we're going to have various dignitaries of our TC campus share with us updates on how we are all making steps towards reconciliation. We cannot overstate the importance of RRI to the ongoing work of diversity, equity, and inclusion here at Texas Christian University. This is a fundamental and ongoing fulfillment of our mission. Our work is not done, and this event does not signal an end, but a beginning. Grace and reconciliation is for any and everyone. We all play a part in the future of our legacy. This is not something that's only for me, for Black, Indigenous, people of color. This is for anyone who dares to wear the purple and wear it with pride. So this is an invitation to anyone listening and looking. This is indeed our story. This is our opportunity. And therefore, reconciliation will be ours if we embrace it together. Wow, um, it still gives me um, goosebumps when I see that. I'm like, who is that person? Uh, uh, wow. Um, so as you can see, um, this was labor of a lot of love. Uh, it was um, not easy and it's still ongoing. Um, you know, I uh, want to um, state that when it's ongoing, I can actually maybe partially answer Artudo because I'm about to open up for Q&A here in just a second. I can partially answer Artudo's question because um, we received this a lot. Um, when we first received the charge to study TCU's relationship with racism, slavery, and the Confederacy, we absolutely and expressly and explicitly prioritized the Black American experience. You know, I, I have no qualms or equivocations about that. It is impossible to talk about all three of those topics without talking about the Black American experience. That being said, the Black American experience is not the only experience. It's a unique experience. I know, I know none other like it. It's a unique experience, but obviously there's more aspects of the story to tell. So this first year, that was the central focus and lens by which we, we did our report. But at the same time, if you look at our report, um, which is available online and through the, the website, the link that I gave you, um, you will see that uh, we have to talk about our indigenous brothers and sisters who were here first. And so um, we have to acknowledge the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose homeland, historical homeland, our university is located. Right, you know, we have to do that. So um, we we do touch on it, but um, there's room in uh, in growth area for us to grow in that regard in terms of adding on to that aspect of the story. Right, and here's a link to the report by the way, in case you're curious. Um, also, so to Arturo's question about our brown brothers and sisters, this also is an aspect of our story that we have to incorporate into our. Um, our narratives moving forward. And that is what we're currently negotiating in terms of for year two and beyond, you know, how to broaden the lens horizontally so that we're able to incorporate more effectively um, the various aspects of our campus identity. Now to Arturo's question, um, even though uh, obviously I'm African-American and proud of it. And even though African-American was the, 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 shall we say the pivot point of our research uh, last year, I found it necessary for us to, remember where we're talking about step three, when we talk about creating a community, 
I found it necessary for us to um, speak to various aspects of our community. And so um, we did have a couple of um, town halls whereby, uh, you know, upon the, the distribution of, uh, you know, uh, of, of local uh, you know, um, key educator, Jacinto Ramos, we were able to connect with the North Side, you know, what's happening in the community and how TC can better create that create relationship with the North Side, so close, but yet so far away, right? I think that's honest. Um, we also had, a, you know, we had a number of, um, you know, we had a number of programs throughout the year that spoke to various aspects of our indigenous community, our Asian American community, our, you know, our Latinx communities. So we did find it necessary to make these points of contact along the way. Um, that being said, there's still more room for growth, right? I told you this is organic and um, this was um, a work in progress, you know, and it is still a work in progress, right? So um, to the extent that, um, you know, and anyone who's looking or listening sees, you know, an avenue or area of growth, um, by all means, you know, we're, we're open to this idea of, um, you know, any additive or constructive criticism. But again, you know, I never said that we were perfect or we're going to be perfect. So if you come at me as if, you know, I should have thought of everything, then, you know, I think you're going to miss me. I think, I think you're going to miss me with that angle. So, you know, because the bottom line is we were very clear and very explicit about that no matter what we did, we simply resolved to do the best we could with what we had. My name is Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., AKA Dr. G, and that's my story about reconciliation. And I'm sticking to it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. G. You've shared so much information with us today. Um, let's take a look at the question and answer to see if we have anything else posted. We welcome anybody to chime in right now with any questions that Dr. G has raised for you. Um, I'm not sure if you addressed, uh, this is sort of a, uh, an outside the box question, um, the Egyptian wall carving on your background. We, we had uh, someone inquire about that. Okay, thank you. And also I, I neglected to talk about um, uh, the, the founders. I mean, in terms of historic, I mean, we're talking about history. I, I need to talk about the founders as well. So, well, okay. So, in terms of the, the Go background, right ahead. sure. So, in terms of the background, um, you know, I think it's a, a bit more, um, shall we say, picturesque than what is in my background, right? So, I'm, I'm trying to spare y'all. You know, um, you, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a family man. You know, you know, I have kids, and um, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to spare the public. And so that's for the greater good. But also, this, when we talk about history. And where to begin, you know, uh, Leanna, uh, is, it may be a small quibble, but when I was growing up, you know, I, I read history books that told me that um, Egypt was in the Middle East. And having personally been there physically myself, I actually traveled to the continent of Africa, right? And so, I, I, you know, I just, it's a subtle, but I think significant reminder that, you know, of what I'm connected to. You know, I'm an African American, and so Egypt's not from the Middle East; it's in Africa. And again, if you have—I don't know if you've been there, but when you have the chance to go, you look in the walls, and you know there's these 2,000-year-old, you know, paintings. They had white paint, you know, you know, because you know they painted, you know, their their, their smocks, their hats. They had white paint, but magically, you know, when it came to the the flesh colorings, they were brown people like me, right? So this idea of you know what's in contention now—this idea of whitewashing history. It's like, you know, even when you look at like, you know, like movies and, and, you know, Cleopatra, you know, you know, Elizabeth Taylor, you know, that sort of deal. You know, this idea that, you know, oh, this great civilization, how, how could it be? Oh, it couldn't be black. No, maybe it was. And it is, you know, and so, you know, I'm just, it's just a subtle reminder of what, you know, how, how do we tell the history, right? You know, so again, ladies and gentlemen, check your maps out. Egypt is located in the continent of Africa. Okay, now going back to the um, uh, the, the the founders, because um, you know I, I think that's a meaty question because I, I talked a little bit about the enslavement piece, but I didn't talk about the Confederacy, and I promise to circle back to that. 
So um, when we look at the uh, founders, Addison and Randolph Clark, I want to state for the record that what we have on campus is not a Confederate statue, okay? Because there is some consternation and there was a bit of controversy on our campus that, oh, well, Addison Randolph Clark, man, this is a Confederate statue on our campus, right? Um, you know, and I think what we were able to discern and find is that um, that is not the case. Uh, and so let me, to explain, um, and I, I just, for the edification of our audience here, I just want to uh, do this so we can see what I'm talking about. Okay, bam. So here's Addison Randolph Clark. So at the very beginning of the, year, the school year, you know, fresh off, because let's, let's not forget, I mean, in terms of history, last summer, uh, let's not forget all those conversations about tearing down Confederate memorials, right? Because, you know, we were woke, right? Remember that, Lena, Linda, right? This idea that we were becoming woke. And, and so, you know, a lot of people were asking questions as to like, well, why, why do we have Confederate statues up? I mean, are the ideas behind, um, you, know, uh, you know, are these still the ideas that are consistent with our, our values today, right? You know, in that larger conversation, right? And so ongoing debate over, is it history, is it heritage? Or is it hegemony? And you just need to, you know, remove it if you know if that no longer reflects your society. Okay, so that conversation touched upon our campus in terms of the the word or the rumor. I don't want to say rumor, but the the narrative, shall we say, being spread across our campus that this is a Confederate statue. So we debated as to what to do, but from the very beginning, I think what was good was we decided not to do nothing, right? And I know this, I'm not, I'm not a grammarian, I'm a historian, but my point is that we decided to do something, right? Better said. So from the very beginning uh, in August, we installed this marquee. Now, again, is it revolutionary? No, it's not, okay? But my whole position is you don't make a hard right turn in an ocean liner ship, okay? You, you just don't do that, right? And so, um, it's easy, my Prius. Yes, Linda, I do. I'm very proud of my Prius. Small footprint, small footprint. Linda. Okay, so I'm very proud. But the point is that in an ocean liner ship, you have to move by degrees, right? And so um, I think, uh, in terms of just taking it down, you know, that would have been that would have been very difficult to do. So we put it this marquee, and if you look very closely, there's a QR code right here on the side. And so that was this, at least to acknowledge that, hey. We don't have the answer, but we're looking for it. We're working on it. And if you check out this QR code, it will take you to the website where, hey, you can actually join in on the conversation. You can actually join in on one of these uh, subcommittees. Um, there's events going on. So you can follow along and see what we're doing, um, you know, as opposed to us not having anything there because the, the, the concern was that, you know, the narrative would take on a life of its own. So what we did discover is this, excuse the preamble. Addison Clark, 100% enlisted and served in the Confederate Army. He actually rose uh, to be uh, the, the, the rank of corporal. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think it was a company D. And uh, it's in the report. And if I misquote myself, don't shoot me, just read the report. But the bottom line is he absolutely enlisted. His brother, Randolph Clark, did not formally enlist, but he did join his brother Addison later, right before the war ended. Now, there's a book called Reminiscence that you can read and you can judge for yourself, where they talk about, Randolph Clark talks about why they joined the, the incursion. His explanation or defense is, hey, we were just defending our homeland. And if anything, if we did not pick up arms, our neighbors would have taken us to task. Right, you know, so we were in a situation where we had to defend our land. Okay, so it's up to you to decide whether you agree with it or not. But the bottom line is, it's a document, is a is a documentable fact that Addison enlisted and served in the Confederacy. Now, hold that thought. Let's fast forward. After 
after the Civil War, you had what's called the lost cause narrative, right? Which is remembering the Civil War in a way that is most sympathetic to the losing side or the South or the Confederacy, right? And again, uh, debates still range. Um, for example, Linda could probably attest, if we go to our local library, um, you'll probably find more books written about the Civil War than any other period in US history. I mean, I'm, 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 I don't know, you, you tell me, I mean, but I mean, people are still talking about the Civil War, right? And how to interpret it. And so there's one uh, angle that says the Civil War is not fought over slavery. Ladies and gentlemen, my professional opinion, and that, that is, it's in, excuse my French, and I don't mean to, to be vulgar, but that is fiddlesticks and poppycock. Okay, uh, enslavement was absolutely a factor, a significant factor in the Civil War being fought. Okay, so we can have that debate later, but it was absolutely a factor. So isn't it ironic, this idea of my freedom is premised upon the enslavement and exploitation of another? Absolutely fascinating. So immediately afterwards, you had many who decided to wage another type of war, a quiet war, if you will. You know, maybe not a cold war, but a but a but a lukewarm, stealthy war, whereby uh, many uh, 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 the many educators who had influence, you know, um, you know, started teaching about this lost cause, and then you have an organization called United Daughters of the Confederacy, who fundraised like nobody's business to erect over 400 monuments and memorials to Confederate soldiers, right? You know, and most of these monuments went up during the period of 1900 to 1940, believe it or not, okay? I, I believe all, on all, all total, I think we have over like 825 Confederate monuments and memorials. So they, they're responsible for nearly half, right? Absolutely amazing. So, what we do know about Confederate memorials and monuments is they're pretty express and explicit, okay? Either they're in regalia or, you know, the, the, the wording on, on the statute is, is pretty clear. In our assessment, this, what you see here is not, N-O-T, a Confederate memorial. There's no insignia, there's nothing that expressly or explicitly connects or ties Addison Randolph Clark to the Confederacy. It is a founder's statute in every meaning of the word. It is built to honor those who found, credited the founding TCU. Addison and Randolph Clark in 1873, two brothers with a vision. Here's the irony. Even though TCU was segregated nearly a century, they were also forward thinking in that they were a co-ed institution from the very out, uh, outset. And even though we think nothing of it now, in fact, uh, uh, the majority of our student base is women. But at that time, this was, this was like mind boggling. Like that fourth, oh my God, we were one of the few uh, universities west of the uh, Mississippi that allowed for women and men to uh, go to school at the same time, right? So they were forward thinking in that respect, but then on a race piece, you know, right? You know, okay. But the point is this, this statute was erected in 1993 as a tribute to the founders. It is not a federal statute. That being said, as we discussed, the founders do indeed, as documented, have Confederate ties. And so this is part of our dilemma, right? How do we go about telling the story? And uh, Leanna and Linda, you know, you know, I'm an absolute professor, so that's why I need these questions. I, I forgot and I neglected to tell you. This. By the way, if you go on the website, you can, if you're interested and have the stomach for it, like you can watch the whole Reconciliation Day program. It's like an hour and a half. But you can fast forward to the points where like, you know, because I don't know if you saw, the chancellor was there, the, 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 the chair, the board of trustees was there and spoke, the uh, provost was there and spoke, the dean of admissions was there and spoke, the athletic director was there and spoke, right? So, I mean, this was like important. This was significant. Like, you know, this wasn't just me and a couple, you know, students running around campus. No, I mean, this is TC saying that, no, we're serious about this. And a couple announcements that uh, I neglected to mention, excuse me, I'm absent-minded, was that our athletic director, Jeremiah Donati, he announced that TCU for the first time is gonna have a statue of a non-white individual on campus. And that is to the great Dr. James Cash, who is credited with integrating 
um, you know, the Southwest Conference, right? Not, not, not just TCU Athletics, but with the in 1967, when he played basketball. Uh, he is a brilliant um, professor, uh, retired professor and uh, you know, entrepreneur who has uh, had a building named after him from some little small school in Cambridge. I don't know if you heard of it, Harvard. Yeah, like they named the building after him. So it was high time that TCU, you know, recognized him as well. Okay, and so we're we're proud to announce what we we did that day. Jeremiah did that. We're going to have a statue to Dr. James Cash on our campus. Another outgrowth, um, yeah, I think is quite profound. Is based upon our affiliation with the University Studying Slavery, we were able to benefit from the brainstorming of brilliant University of Virginia students. They have, you know, we have Maymester, right? It's like it's like a three. Linda, what Maymester is? It's like a, it's like the last three weeks of May where students can like get in a course you know, get, get in and get out. They're like longer sessions, et cetera. But for, you know, that way, you know, they have their summers free, that sort of deal. Well, they have what's called J-term, January term, similar idea, right? Where you can get your credits in. So that way you're able to. So for J-term, they took us on as a client for this architecture class. And many of their ideas are actually going to be incorporated in what is going to be a new statute design, whereby we're not going to remove the statute because early on we had this debate about what to do about the statute. Do we do something? Do we not do something? What do we do? How do we do it? So we, we came up with a with the solution. It's not going to happen overnight. So if you go there next Tuesday, it's not going to be there, right? Be patient, right? But it's, you know, this in process, okay? We're not going to remove the statute, but we're going to remove the power dynamic. These brilliant minds at the University of Virginia came up with this idea of creating a ramp whereby passerbys can walk up and be eye level because that's part of it, right? This idea of walking by and I have to look up and white male patriarchy, you're in charge, you're, you're master over me, you know, you, you know, you're awesome. Now, again, you want to pay homage and respect to the founders, of course, pay homage and respect, but at the same time, they were people who walked the planet too, right? And so we removed the power dynamic and we're going to create like a uh, graffiti wall, if you would, so that way people can express themselves and whatever people say, is whatever we have to roll with because it is a free country. So um, that I wanted to uh, make sure I mentioned before I forgot, these are some of the ways in which we're attempting to reconcile um, the past. Thank you for filling that in about the statue because being right in the middle of campus as it is, so many people are aware and pass by it every single day. So it's important that we have a plan for it. Um, I do have a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, uh, Mr. Montoya, thanks you for your answer uh, on the uh, status of Mexican Americans in the project. And, um, and he says, you know, your focus to date in, in a, is appropriate in view of not only TCU's history with African Americans, but our nations. He says he would encourage you to expand your focus to include the Mexican American experience, which is particularly important in Texas in the Southwest. So, um, so as you make progress in the next year, we'll all be interested to see uh, how you are able to incorporate those, uh, those pieces of the puzzle uh, into your research. Our, um, another attendee asks, uh, were there any big surprises discovered in this first phase of the initiative. Sure. And first of all, let me just say, I'm very thankful for Peter's comment. And, you know, I mean, cause this is, this is what we need, right? In order to stay honest. And I, I just want to just state for the record that just like it's impossible to tell the story of race, slavery and the Confederacy without incorporating African-Americans, how can any fool worth their salt talk about history in Tejas <laughs> without, no, seriously, without incorporating our Mexican American experience. I mean, this is foolhardy. And it's amazing as it is alarming how our brown brothers and sisters have been omitted from the record for so long. And so, Arturo, I appreciate you, um, you know, reminding us of, you know, areas of growth, you know. And, and, and so, again, we couldn't do it all, so to speak. I mean, the way I analogize it is, I mean, you know, when you come to a door, like your whole family wants to get in the house, but not everybody can walk through the door at the same time. It's, it's a is, right, I mean, everyone wants to get in the house, but so blacks men in first, okay? I'm, I'm sorry, that's just the way it went, okay? But Arturo, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, that is high priority, okay? So stay tuned, my brother. Stay tuned, high priority. 
Um, in terms of surprises, I think, uh, you know, what was um, fascinating was we actually, as a part of our research, went out to Thorpe Spring. And for those of us who are keeping score, original site of TCU's founding, then it moved to Waco. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, from Waco came to Fort Worth, okay? And so, you know, what's fascinating is uh, how, uh, you know, the, the brothers, you know, you know, the Christian ethos, they, they felt that Fort Worth was too hot. You know, it was called Hell's Half Acre, right? You know, the, the, the train kind of ended here and, and they, they felt this is just too much with our Christian values. You know, we, we gotta leave here. I'm oh, sorry, Lynn, did you wanna say something about that? Or you took your mic off? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, you seem like you took your mic off. But yeah, so th they felt in order to preserve the sanctity of what they're trying to do, it was better for them to go to Thorpe Spring. And so what was surprising, and this is also due to the magnificent research of our postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Sylvia Ann Greensward, uh, we discovered a gentleman by the name of Charlie Thorpe. Um, now, again, if you are really interested, you can go to our, uh, our website because all of our town halls are posted for you know, the benefit of anyone who wants to look. And I, I can't remember, I think it was like in April, it was like early April, the name of it is called Who is Charlie Thorpe? And so she hosted this one and she tells this fascinating story about how he was not technically enslaved at the time. He was in fact enslaved by old man Thorpe, right? You know, for which the town uh, Thorpe Spring was named. He was enslaved, but you know, obviously emancipation came. He decided to still stay in Thorpe Spring and still work for the family. And this is, some people are like, well, like, well why? Why didn't you just like run and take the next flight out to Canada? Well, first of all, there weren't any flights to Canada back in the 1860s, A, aha, uh -huh. and then B, um, think about it. I mean, it was just, you know, a matter of convenience oftentimes. Like, why am I gonna pick up and start my life all over? I mean, this is what I know, right? And so Charlie Thorpe decided to stay as a free man, but by him deciding to stay and by Charlie, uh, excuse me, and by, and by old man Thorpe uh, deciding to help the Addison brothers with their school, the, you know, let's connect the dots, right? So remember, Charlie Thorpe working for old man Thorpe, Thorpe supporting the brothers. So in essence, Charlie Thorpe's labor was instrumental in not only the, uh, the construction of the building that, that housed uh, you know, the first TCU you know, classes, et cetera, but also, I mean, he took on a number of um, you know, responsibilities. You know, he was like fireman to you know, janitor to gardener to, I mean, he, I mean you know, he, you know, to, he was, doing, he was doing a lot to help keep TCU afloat in the early years. And so TCU would not be where it is were it not for the unheralded contributions of Charlie Thorpe. Well, largely unheralded until, until now. And that's the benefit of uncovering and discovering a story like this to, to give it its proper light and attention. And so um, we still have some more digging to do, you know, to tell the full story. Of, of, of Charlie Thorpe, but, but that was definitely, um, Brenda, a surprise. You know, the, the idea that, you know, at the early stages of TCU's foundation, that uh, you had African-Americans, even though they weren't allowed to take classes, they still were instrumental in the development and growth of the institution. Absolutely fascinating. Well, and Dr. G, I want to add that I, I saw the program on Charlie Thorpe and uh, was able to watch it on the Race and Reconciliation Initiative website. So I encourage any of you who would like to learn more about Charlie Thorpe's story, uh, visit the website. You can watch the full program about him uh, right there. And it's very interesting uh, to learn the details of his life. And I know there is still more to come uh, for his story. Now I have, uh, I have one more uh, question for you. And unfortunately I have to say that we do need to wrap up at noon. So this is kind of a broad question to ask <laughs> with a limited amount of time. But uh, one of our attendees asks, um, he says, it's really good to see you. He says, can you explain critical race theory? what it is, pros and cons in terms of the future of the USA's continued global leadership. Oh, wow. so you hit me with the atom bomb on the way out. Okay. I, I, I yeah, apologize yeah, yeah. Okay. for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let me, what do you think, Leanna? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, 
first of all, I just want to give a shout out. Uh, thank you, Glenda, for the Gil Scott Heron uh, poem. Um, you know, or is that Linda? Yeah, yeah. Gil Scott is, is a brilliant mind. So thank you for that. Um, you know, <sighs> critical race theory founded by um, actually lawyers. So you, you have lawyers to blame for this one, right? Um, so Derek Bell is considered one of the founders. Uh, he also was at Harvard Law School. Um, and the idea was that um, he and many others, whether it be Richard Delgado, Margaret Montoya, Kimberly Crenshaw, they were trying to look at, is there more than one way to tell the story, right? So for example, we tell the story about Thomas Jefferson. We say he's complex. Um, is that maybe whitewashing or sugarcoating? Because uh, clearly he was a brilliant mind. I don't know, Linda or Leanna, if you had the chance to go, but I've been to Monticello. Uh, it's, uh, I'm still, oh geez, I'm still sharing my screen. Okay, as you see, I, I put in Arturo's information because I'm a man of my word, I'm gonna follow up with him. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know, that's community, I appreciate that. Okay, <laughs> but the point is that um, when we talk about, say, Thomas Jefferson, yes, he was a brilliant mind. I agree. I absolutely agree. I've, I've been to his house in Monticello. You know, he had he uh, had this invention that um, where he hit the, hooked up a wire to a pen. So he, when he wrote, the other pen wrote the same thing that he did on a piece of paper. In other words, it was like a copier before we had a, a, a Xerox machine. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, I mean, when was the last time you invented something like that, right? Brilliant mind. At the same time, um, for anyone uh, who has not heard the history, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, shall we say, is a founding father in more ways than one, right? You know, and, uh, and let's just say that he uh, fathered uh, several children uh, from, uh, you know, enslaved individuals. Uh, and, you know, uh, the first child was conceived uh, when, you know, the enslaved individuals as young as 13 or 14 years old, right? So you tell me, can someone consent at age 13 or 14? And not to mention just consent generally, but also they were enslaved. So would it be fair to say Thomas Jefferson, comma, the rapist? That doesn't sound quite so good, okay? But critical race theory is about this idea of, well, you know, we're gonna take a look at all aspects of the truth and be critical of these larger narratives that we've just accepted wholesale. So I'm not necessarily saying we need to tell school children, uh, you know, in third grade, you know, Thomas Jefferson was a rapist, you know, you know let's repeat the song y'all. But at some point in time, if it happened and if it is true, why deny our children of this fact before they graduate grade 12? So at some point in time, let's get it in. Because what happens is, what do we do if we don't tell the full story? We end up in a situation where you have smart people, well-educated, who are doing what? Repeating the mistakes to the past all because, oh, I didn't know. Because again, if maybe you had this information about Thomas Jefferson earlier, it might count. It doesn't say you throw the baby out with the bathwater and now, you know, again, for some people that, that maybe, you know, that, that's a line, you know, 13 year older, sorry, I can't touch that anymore. So maybe it does. Well, for others, maybe it tempers, you know, this idea of, okay, he's, you know, I, I like the things he did, you know, in his notes in Virginia, and, you know, and what he had to say about all, you know, the, we hold these trees to be self-evident, but at the same time, you know, I, I can't, you know, just run away here, right? You know, we, we need to, you know, just balance, you know, the history. So critical race theory can come off as anti-American only because it pokes holes, I think, in many of these glorified hero narratives, okay? And so for me, my two cents in closing is that I don't believe that we should be critical just for critical sake. Right, you know, I mean, we can tear down anything and everyone, you know, because I'm not perfect, okay? You know, I, you know, so I'm not throwing any stones because, you know, I, I have plenty of glass panes in my house, okay? But what I am saying is that, uh, Leanna, if it's true, if it's factual, if it's documented, then it needs to be told. The whole story needs to be told. And only by us reconciling with these darker chapters can we embrace a brighter future? So for anyone who's listening to me right now, Leanna and Linda, 
My whole piece is we shouldn't erase our history, but rather embrace it. And by knowing our past and having a firm handle on it, we truly have the opportunity to influence the future. Thank you. That is an excellent note to end on. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you spending your Saturday morning with us. We appreciate all of our audience who spent their Saturday morning with us. Uh, do remember, if you logged in late, you would like to catch the first part of this program. The uh, video will be on the library's YouTube channel in about uh, 10 days to two weeks. And... Um, we will hope that we can uh, we can plan to see everyone in the fall. We'll we'll all be aspiring to that, and we'll give you some more information. Uh, otherwise, uh, I want to wish everyone a terrific afternoon. Um, and Dr. Gooding, thanks again for being with us. Linda, do you have anything else to add? I would just like to thank Dr. Gooding for an enjoyable and informative presentation today. It was a pleasure. Okay, well, um, I just wanna say good afternoon to everybody then and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.